Bible Church, it's nice to see uh, some people in the church house this morning. If you will stand with me and open up in your big blue hymnal to page 370. Page 370, count your blessings. Page 370 in your big blue hymnal.
this morning, brethren. We've been blessed uh, yesterday, brethren, and we'll be blessed tomorrow, Amen. brethren. Amen. Do not be discouraged. Yes. God is over all. Amen. 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 You know, I've been sort of uh, meditating on this uh, verse in the Bible out of Hebrews. Uh, and the Bible says, uh, for by him, speaking of Jesus Christ, for by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Yeah, amen, amen, brethren. Amen. We don't make much of, of holidays or holy days around here for for uh, for good reason. But uh, out of Thanksgiving in my house is the biggest holy day of the year for us. I'm, I, I, I am, uh, love a day where you can just sit back with your family and just think about all the wonderful blessings. Think about everything that we have to be thankful for. Amen. Amen. And uh, just thinking about that verse and meditating on that verse and not, not preaching, but just trying to encourage you guys. Uh, I was looking up the word fruit and the word fruit of our, our lips and, uh, you know, Fruit is mentioned many times in the book of Genesis, and uh, one of the times it's mentioned, it says that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground, right? What the ground produced, that's why we call it produce, right? What the ground produced, that's what Cain brought. And uh, I was trying to figure out in my mind what the fruit of my lips are, the fruit of my lips. And uh, initially, I just think to myself, it's, it's the words that come out, you know, but the words that come out of my mouth, at least, are not always fruitful, right? The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And, and unfortunately, I'm only two-thirds saved, I guess you can say, right? So sometimes the things that come out of my mouth aren't so, uh, aren't so fruitful. But I, I was looking that up in the Bible. And in Isaiah chapter 57, God says, I create the fruit of the lips. God says, I create the fruit of the lips. So just thinking about this and meditating on this, the question I asked myself, and perhaps maybe you guys can ask yourselves, is can my words, the words that come out of my mouth, right? The words, can they bear fruit? Can the words that come out of my mouth encourage someone else to give thanks to the Lord? That's the question I've been asking myself. Can the fruit of my lips, the words that come out of my mouth, can that encourage the hearer to give thanks to the Lord? If that makes some kind of sense, I hope that makes some kind of sense. And that's not solely my words. That's also the spirit of God working in there. That's why God says that he creates the fruit, right? But uh, I don't know, just a great thought, just a great thought to live a thankful life and have a thankful heart and uh, just to try to be, a, a, you know, an encouragement to others. And uh, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just being a Brooklyn boy, but, but sometimes I'm really quick with my tongue and slow with my brain, you know, so uh, it's just... Uh, Something that just encourages me to just uh, think a little bit more before I speak. Amen? Amen. All right, let's open up in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, first and foremost, we thank you for the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, we thank you uh, for these that have uh, uh, braved the times, Lord, and uh, come out uh, to the church house this morning, Lord. We pray for those of uh, our folks who are home uh, still on the mend, Father God. We pray for Mr. Upton this morning, Lord God, that you just... Heal them up, Lord. Give the doctors uh, wisdom. Uh, uh, we pray for uh, others also, Father God. And uh, Lord, uh, I just just thinking this morning, Father God, it's it's this 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 thing, this coronavirus, Father God, is is very contagious, Lord. But thankfulness is also contagious, Father God. And uh, I'm just uh, thankful for 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 you and everything that you are this morning, Father God. And I'm grateful that I'm allowed to, uh, to be uh, counted one of yours, Father God. I'm grateful for you. my salvation, Father God. I'm grateful for your sacrifice, Lord, and I uh, just pray this morning, Lord, we can be an encouragement to your people, Father God. I pray for the many, I'm sure, who are home watching uh, online, Lord. I pray, Father, that uh, uh, you, know, you speak to their hearts uh, through the message, Father God. I do pray for Pastor Dean this morning as he preaches, Lord. Give him unction from on high, Father God, give him uh, clarity of mind and thought, Lord, and uh, help him to uh, minister to us this morning, I pray, Father, and uh, we love you, Lord, and as we continue to sing your praises, Lord God, I, I want you to know, Father, that it's my heart's desire that you get all the honor and glory, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's uh, sing uh, page 20, page 20 in your big blue hymnal. I'm reminded of the times when there were two or three people in here, uh, you know, at
coronavirus round one, so it's, it's a blessing to see uh, the many we have here this morning on round two, amen? All right. We don't know this one. You know, I was looking for, we praise thee, O God, for the sun. What page is it? 485, okay. Sorry, guys. Still have sheetrock on the brains this morning. 485, revive us again. Page 17 in your big blue hymnal. We'll do this one more before Pastor comes. Page 17. Um 
thy goodness like a fetter by my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Amen, amen. Good singing this morning, brethren. You may be seated. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. Um, open your Bible this morning with me to Hebrews chapter 10. I really think that these verses are going to, we're probably going to need to write them on the wall somewhere, maybe behind the pulpit here. It's going to be our theme verses for the next uh, who knows how long until the Lord appears. But uh, you know these verses, we've referred to them often, but I really think we've got to really take them to heart. And... Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, this is that part of, you know, like many parts of Hebrews, we can absolutely directly apply it to the New Testament church. It certainly applies to us. Uh, verse number 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Profession is what you outwardly confess, like you profess. So we, we oh, Angel, good morning. Good to have you here this morning. Um, but uh, this is your testimony. Your profession is your testimony. This is, you know, a, you testify, you profess. This is your testimony. This is what others see in you um, of Jesus Christ. And so hold that fast. Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. We're going to need that in the days ahead. Amen. For he is faithful, that promised. That's why we don't waver. Not because brothers and sisters in Christ don't sometimes waver. But your Savior, Savior never wavers. His, his promises, he, he, he never second guesses himself. It was true, whatever was true in the very beginning is still true today. And he never wavers. He's absolutely the same. By, and Hebrews tells us that as well. Same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. All right? With whom there is no variableness. All right? uh, so there's no shadow of turning with God. He doesn't change his mind here. He's faithful. His promises can be counted on all the way to the very end. He is faithful. They're promised. And let us consider one another. So not only watch our testimony, not waver, but be mindful of one another. You know, these times that we're going through are not times for us to uh, withdraw ourselves into our own protective little cocoon, right? It's time for us to consider one another. Uh, to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Because you have to believe that underneath all of this, since the devil knows his greatest threat today is Bible-believing Christians who will live godly. Right? That's the only threat to whatever he hopes to accomplish. And, of course, his great accomplishment is not necessarily what happens with nations, but just deceiving men and women, keeping them blind to their own sin, keeping them blind to who the Savior is, keeping them ignorant of the gospel. You and I are the ones entrusted with that gospel. And so a Bible-believing Christian with the love of God in their heart, a confidence in the Word of God, and a love for sinners is a, is a threat, is a tremendous threat. And this local church is necessary to your good health as a, as a Christian, to our spiritual health. We need this. We need church. We need fellowship. We need to labor together, pray together, hear the Word of God together. We need to fellowship. It's important. The devil knows that. So it's not surprising that in these last days, um, I have to believe that a lot of this is just to keep churches and keep believers from getting together, from being together. Uh, and so let us not, as, as the manner of some is, forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, just encourage one another, encourage one another, because brothers and sisters fall sometimes, they falter, it's okay. When two walk together, one falls, but you know you have someone with you to help you back up again. You get back on your feet and you keep going. 
And so we exhort one another, and watch this, and this is it, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, right? These three verses, I mean, we got to, I think we got to imprint them on our hearts, and uh, maybe I'll imprint them on our walls here or something, just as a continual reminder to us, as we see that day approaching, the, the day of the Lord's appearing for His church, we, I mean, things are getting crazier than we ever thought they could get right now, right? But... We have a refuge in Jesus Christ. And we don't want to lose our focus as a church. Uh, we want to remember why we were put here on this earth. And that is to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to do those things that further that ministry. And uh, we need to be a blessing to each other and encourage one another. So uh, anyway, I just thought it was on my mind this morning as we were singing. And here's something silly. This is something silly. We were, um, what is that, the one, the next to the last song um, that we just sang? Not the last one, but the one before that. Count, yeah, the, we sing amen, right? Revive us, Revive us again. All right, we always say amen, right? It, none of us, when you say amen to the preaching, do you say amen or amen? Amen. amen. You know, but we sing that for some reason. It's just a, the, with me. I just want to loudly uh, go the up, swim upstream, and I say revive. How does the line go? This God, Amen, and I forget how that goes. Hallelujah, Amen, Amen. When I hear good preaching, I don't say Amen. I said Amen. But you know what? Even Google doesn't like Amen. If you say Amen into Google, like you're trying to text somebody, it always comes out Hey man, Hey man. I, and I try, I've gone Amen, Hey man, Amen, Hey man. But if you say amen, Google likes that. It'll give you amen in the text. I said, look at that. Huh? Sounds like an Android says it sounds like an Android problem. <laughs> like problem. <laughs> I might be, maybe. Well, but, you know, iPhone is much more closely in sync with the world, you know. So anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, I was, my mind was going back there. I want to say amen. I want to say amen. You can say amen if you like to. That's fine. I don't care. But anyway, all right. Um, some of our folks are pretty sick this morning. We, we know that. We want to continue to pray for them. Tony Calalillo, um, I heard, is doing a little bit better from what we've heard, but still in the hospital and uh, not, out of, not out of danger. Um, a few others have gotten sick in the, in the last couple of days. Mike Damiano's in the hospital. That doesn't seem, according to Allison, that's not, not COVID-related. Uh, Steve Upton is under the weather um, and uh, a little bit symptomatic there, so he's quarantining, and uh, so just pray for Steve. Um, thank you for your prayers for Lauren. Uh, the Lord was very merciful there. We're thankful that she's okay. She had a, some complications uh, after the delivery. We went to the city last night to the hospital. She was, uh, they had to take her to the, uh, to the ER, but she's, she's good. She's doing fine. Uh, and she'll be coming home from the hospital today. Uh, so please uh, continue to pray for her. Just pray that the Lord will use this in her life. Um, and uh, uh, who else? Somebody else that we can't remember now. My mind went blank. Uh, we had a great turnout yesterday. Um, we had an army of guys show up to help us. We praise the Lord for that. Thank you for everyone that came to work yesterday. We got a lot done, uh, much more than we ever expected. Uh, Lord willing, uh, this week uh, we might be putting in the heating system and some other things. Uh, just a few, you know, we still a little work to do to finish everything up, but uh, appreciate all the work and all the the generosity of our people just to take care of the expense of this. But uh, it's just been incredible. And we just thank the Lord for how all of that is coming together. All right. Uh, I think that's it. I can't think of, oh, the uh, Ladies Fellowship is coming up. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back, ladies, December the 11th. Please uh, be aware of that um, and sign up uh, so we kind of know how much food to get. Prepare for that. And uh, I think that's it. That's all I can think of. Um, let's just take a minute and uh, just pray for our families, uh, pray for those uh, in our church family that are uh, still dealing with the aftermath of COVID. Uh, those that were sick a couple of weeks ago are doing much better. Uh, almost everybody is, uh, you know, healed up. Pat's back again, praise the Lord. And uh, Mark is here this morning, amen for that. Um, so uh, just pray for that. A couple of our families have been through uh, funerals recently and lost loved ones, so we want to continue to 
pray for them uh, just as, as they uh, deal with those things. All right? Let's pray together now, if we could. Our Father, Lord God, we thank you again this morning, Lord, for this uh, beautiful time to be together, beautiful day you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy upon this little group of people, Lord. We love you. We thank you for all you've given us and done for us, Lord. The, the history of looking back over your provision for this church, Lord, is, uh, it just blesses my heart, Lord, every time we sit and think about it. But thank you for uh, your kindness, and thank you, Lord, for your protection. And Lord, I pray that uh, these verses that we just read again, we read them a hundred times, Lord, even in the last few months. But Lord, I pray that we truly could understand the spirit of those words and get the truth of it and understand as a church family how to live those things, how to hold fast the profession of our faith, how to encourage and exhort one another, how to love one another and consider one another in these days that we're going through. Lord, this is a time when as a church family we need... We need this gathering together, Lord. Uh, we need this fellowship and this assembly. And uh, I pray for our families, Lord, that are struggling, uh, not just with sickness. Some of them are dealing with COVID and other things. I pray for Mike in the hospital and Tony in the hospital and uh, for Steve uh, and Kristen Carapresso and others, Lord, uh, that are not, uh, not feeling well. Lord, we pray for healing in their lives and for your protection in their lives. We pray for some of our families that are going through other heartaches right now, some real deep waters, Lord, uh, that some of them are dealing with, Lord, marital things and financial things. And, Lord, uh, it surely is a trying of our faith. And we just pray, Lord, that through these things, your people would just keep their eyes on you, put, your, put you first, put your counsel first, uh, and just help us, Lord. Help us as a church. Lord, in difficult times, it's often that uh, people... Uh, get very self-centered and, and turn on one another even. But Lord God, I pray that you'd help us to remember the spirit of those words that we just read, Lord. Help us truly, Lord, in this time to love each other like we ought to. And uh, strengthen our church and help us, Lord. Pour out your grace here, Lord, so that we can deal with the times that we're living through. We pray for our government, for our country and what it's going through, Lord. We pray that your will may be done <clears throat> in this election. And Father... Uh, Lord, uh, do those things that further the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel, Lord. We pray that your will would be accomplished and uh, pray for the protection of your people and the peace of your people, Lord. And help us, Lord, as a church, Lord, to not miss the opportunities that you've put right before us here. Uh, men's hearts are failing them for fear. And, uh, Lord, uh, and just seeing the things that are coming upon this world, Lord, and we just pray that you may help us, Lord, that we might be prepared and, uh, and, and be able to minister to people around us. Pray that you'd help us, Lord, when it comes to getting the gospel out, that we might double our efforts and uh, just give us the vision, Lord, that we need. And we pray you bless all the literature that's been given out in Operation Jerusalem and the tracks that are going out and even the things that have been, the, uh, the things that have been left right at people's doors, Lord. And the, we just thank you for the fruit of all of that, Lord. And, we pray that through these things, you alone would get all the glory. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that we do see that day approaching. Thank you for that great, blessed hope that we have before us, Lord, of your soon appearing. And Lord God, may you prepare us as a church. Help us, Lord, uh, to be focused upon you and upon your return. And prepare us, Lord, uh, that we could uh, just be a shining, a burning and a shining light, Lord, in this generation, in this place where you've put us. We pray for our island and our city, Lord. We pray that people might get saved. We pray that you'd help us to be faithful in declaring the gospel. And uh, may you use us, Lord, during this time. And thank you again for this opportunity this morning, Lord, to hear your word. We pray for Pastor Dean as he preaches this morning. May you give him your power. May you open our ears and our minds, Lord, to receive the truth today. And may the Lord Jesus Christ get all the glory. It's in his precious name that we ask these things. Amen.
time and open up to page 460, 460 in your big blue hymnal. Everyone all right this morning? Yeah? Do we have to have a group hug? <laughs> page 460, leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. Thank you, dear brother. Appreciate our musicians again this morning. What a joy. What a joy it is to be together. I'll tell you what. All right. Perhaps you need a Bible this morning. One of our guys, somebody back there, uh, raise your hand if you need a Bible. Perhaps you. Uh, and if you don't have a King James Bible, uh, that's a gift to you. We want you to uh, be able to follow along. And as we always say, uh, we don't use the King James, read the King James, the uh, Reformation text uh, that God uh, put in our own English language and still rules supreme in heaven and earth. We don't use it by preference. We use it by conviction. And you don't need to be a theologian. All you need to do, and I would challenge you if you think I'm wrong, uh, I would challenge you just open a King James Bible on a table and get f about 130 other versions and just spread them out and see which one speaks to you. Okay. You say, well, what about the these and the thous? You need to, you need to grow up and get over that. That's uh, the only, only thing I can tell you is we New Yorkers are the w most, we're supposed to be the most well-read people in the whole, on the whole earth. And a thee and a thou is going to derail you a little bit? Get over it, all right? You do realize today, and what I'm speaking right now is not really good English. You realize what we speak is gutter English? Your King James Bible is good English. 
You know, I taught a, a, a Korean doctor. I really didn't teach him, but he, uh, he couldn't. He was, uh, he was one of the associate uh, doctors uh, for the doctor. My wife had uh, the, uh, the, the doctor when Nathan was delivered. And, uh, but he, uh, he couldn't speak good English. So there were some nurses in the class that, that uh, back long before coming to New York, that we were back in Ohio. And some of those nurses asked me, I have no idea why they would ask me, I can't even speak good English. How am I gonna teach good English to somebody? But they asked me to teach this Korean doctor English. And I thought, how in the world am I gonna do that? And you know what we did? We sat, uh, you, if you went into his house, uh, there weren't a lot of chairs. Obviously, Deb and I were much younger, and we sat on the floor. All right. But he wanted, you know what he said to me? He said, I don't want to learn trash English. I want to learn good English. And I opened a King James Bible, and for a year, we met once a week. And you know what we did? We just read the King James Bible. I... He left Canton, Ohio, went to Michigan. I have no idea. Dr. Law, I have no idea whatever became of that. But I thought, you know what God impressed me? Just, uh, I mean, if this book speaks to me and it's the King's English, read it and, uh, and, and understand the King's English. All right. All right. Let me see. Uh, I've got a real simple, I want you to turn to John chapter 10 with me. That's just the starting place. The Lord laid something on my heart. It's already been said by Pastor Mike. You know, we live in per a perilous time. And Paul said to, wrote to his son in the Lord, Timothy, in 2 Timothy, young pastor. He told him that perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, unthankful, disobedient. And he went on and on and on. But we live in perilous times. And I try not to let things bother me to the extent. It's, it's like letting your patriotism, and I love my country, letting your patriotism getting, get bigger than your Bible. Okay. There's a danger in that. Forgive me. I have to. This morning is a medication dry mouth, all right? So I just want to look at something simply this morning. I want to look at the bigger picture. You know, you can, I've got you in John chapter 10. And before we get there, one of the, the messages I preached a couple weeks ago, I have it in my hand, I'm not going to read. But I, we talked about four things that characterized the believing remnant of uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And, uh, and it didn't last forever, obviously. They, the time went on and they ended up, Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh and they crucified him. And, and even that was by plan. Okay. It, it's... It, it, that, that, didn't, that didn't take God by surprise, by the way. It didn't take... This whole thing is planned out. I'm going to give Bobby Bowman Sr. the credit for this. And I, I, if I know Bobby, he probably stole it from somebody else. He's like me. The world's been playing checkers for 6,000 years when God's been playing chess. I can play checkers. Given enough time, that's a pretty simple board. I mean, I, I still have a checkerboard at home. As a kid, I can remember playing checkers with my brothers, my sister, my dad, my mom. But boy, we weren't chess players. I have no idea. I know some of you are chess players, and I, I commend you, and I applaud your ability. I have no idea how to play chess, okay? The world thinks that they're really good at things because they can play chess or they can play checkers. But God's a master chess mover. And in all of what we're going through right now, I need to remind myself 
Do you know who's still on the throne? The world has been on fire from the moment that flaming sword was put on the gate of the Garden East in Eden and Adam and Eve walked out. They didn't walk out. They were, they were forced out. The world has been on fire for 6,000 years. Don't panic. God's sitting on the throne letting it happen. And he's had perfect control of everything. Perfect control. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for this morning, Father. Lord, uh, I want to thank you for our folks that are here. I want to thank you for our folks that, for whatever reason, are at home. I just want to say thank you. Lord, help us, deliver us from this spirit of, of fear, anxiety. Just, I agree with my brother pastor. Oh, Lord, I know from my reading of your word, there's a, there's a bigger spirit at play here. This is way bigger than disease. There's something being initiated and we're right on the very verge of stepping out into eternity. Father, thank you. Now, Lord, you know my heart. I, I want to be a blessing. You, Father, you're always a blessing. God is always good, all the time. And Father, I just pray that our, I, I know as I just, the simplicity of this message laid it out in my mind and my heart keep our eyes on the bigger picture it's so easy to get isolated it's so easy to think everything revolves around me and us and when that's really not the truth so i want to thank you and i pray these things in jesus name and for his sake amen Four things that characterize the believing remnant. The first one was loyalty to the word of God. Won't go in, just a quick review. The, the, the second thing happened to be separation from those who mocked the word of God. The third thing that we talked about two weeks ago was they had a wholehearted commitment. That word appears multiple times in Psalm 119, with the whole heart, with the whole heart. And you say, well, why the whole heart? Because in Malachi chapter two and verse nine, Israel had taken the word of God partially, just part of it. They would do a little, not unlike us, not unlike many of God's people. We do a little bit of it, but you know, we, won't, we, won't, we won't take the rest of it seriously. All right. it's, God wants your whole heart. But the last thing I mentioned was this thing about the bigger picture. The bigger picture. This, and the bigger picture was your testimony from, from those things that we, we saw in Ezra. But here, here's, I want to look at the bigger picture this morning. Now, I've, I've got you in John chapter 10. You, you stay in John chapter 10. I want to read, I want to read something to you. I'm going to give you, start with a little story this morning, all right? Now, I've, done, I've read this many times. Somewhere, if you go back in my, uh, the archives of my preaching, you're going to find this, this little story. But I thought it, it, it fits uh, this whole thing. I've gone, my Bible's full of little sayings and stories and charts and whatever. But I want you to listen to this little story. It has a funny title. It's called The Cracked Pot. Now, there are a lot of crack pots in the world, but that's not what we're talking about. Right? This story is, is, is entitled The Cracked Pot. Listen to it. A water bearer in India had two large pots, each hung on opposite ends of a pole, which he carried across his neck, and one of the pots had a crack in it. While the other pot was perfect and always delivered a full portion of water at the end of a long walk from the stream to the master's house, the, the cracked pot arrived only half full all the time. For a full two years, this went on daily, with the bearer delivering only one and a half 
pots full of water in his master's house. Of course, the, the perfect pot was proud of its accomplishments and perfect to the end for which it was made. And, but the poor cracked pot was ashamed of its own imperfection, miserable that it was able to accomplish only half of what it was designed and made to do. After two years of what it perceived to be a bitter failure, it spoke, the pot, it spoke to the water bearer one day by the stream, I am ashamed of myself, and I want to apologize to you. Why, asked the bearer, what are you ashamed of? I have been able for these past two years to deliver only half of my load because this crack in my side causes water to leak out all the way back to the master's house. Because of my flaws, you have to do all of this work and you don't get the full value from my efforts, the pot said. The water bearer felt sorry for the old cracked pot. And in his compassion, he said, as we return to the master's house, I want you to notice the beautiful flowers along the path. Indeed, as they went up the hill, the old cracked pot took notice of the sun warming the beautiful wild flowers on the side of the path, and this cheered it up some. But at the end of the trail, it still felt bad because it had leaked out half its load already, and so again it apologized to the bearer for its failure. The bearer said to the pot, did you notice that there were uh, flowers only on your side of the path, but not on the other pot's side? That's because I have always known about your flaw, and I took advantage of it. I planted flower seeds on your side of the path, and every day while we walk back from the stream, you've watered those seeds, those flowers. For two years, I have been able to pick these flowers to decorate my master's table. Without you and your flaw, being just the way you are, he would not have this beauty to grace his house. A bigger picture. I want you to leave with one thing in your mind today as we go into this. There's a bigger picture being played out. There's a Go back to John chapter 10, because things seem like they're out of control. And I will be honest with you, I get troubled. I've got, a fa I've got three sons and their wives and ten grandchildren, a beloved church family, you, friends, pretty much all over the country that I've learned, that I became friends with because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I get troubled that... The country that my father and four of his brothers at one shot went to World War II. Several went to the Pacific Theater. Several, my dad and I think two of his brothers went to the, the European Theater. And if you tried to pry World War II, I know some men like to gush about their time in combat. My dad was not like that. You could not get World War II out of my dad's mind. He said to me one day, I want to forget what happened over there. So I'm a patriot at heart. I grew up in a, in a, in a time when the, the flag meant something. I've got one big flag flying in the front. I've got, I've got the Pledge of Allegiance on the front of my house. I'm proud to be an American. I know we're not supposed to use the word proud, but you take it, you take it for what I'm saying. I'm troubled about my nation. I'm troubled about the world. But I'm a Christian. I've tried to learn to love my God for soon to be 51 years. And my God always reminds me, and as I read his book, there's a bigger picture. Don't get upset. We sang hymns today that directed us not to be discouraged. I'm supposed to be wise as a, even Jesus said, he said be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. There's a certain wisdom we should have about, about what's happening in our nation. But I've said this, my business in life, 
along with my dear brother, pastor, and all of, all of you, you know, you know we're in the people business? It's more than a building. It's more than even, a, I mean, we're up there finishing up that extension to the print shop, wonderful, pretty little building. We were in the people. Why are we doing that? Just so we can have a new building? We're in the people business. You know what you have to do in the people business? You've got to get out and rub shoulders with them. But this thing has made us afraid. Yes, I'm going to be wise. You want me to wear a mask? I'll wear your mask. You want me to put on a suit of armor that I look like a knight from the Middle Ages? I'll do that too. But I'm in the people business. You know, when, when we sing that song, Count Your Blessing, look at me now. You know what my blessings are? You. You are my blessings. You are my joy. And I'm not mad. You know me. I just got this way about me. You used to be able to stand in line and chit-chat with somebody. Now you're 10 feet apart. You can't chit-chat with anybody. My son, I got to take this thing out of my pocket. This is terrible. I, I brought my thing. To... Caleb sent me a little thing. He said, I went to the grocery store the other day, and they wanted me to stand on an X. The cashier said, you have to stand on that X. And he texted me, and he said, you know, I watched too many Roadrunner movies as a kid. You don't stand on the X because, boom, either you're going up or the anvil's coming down. He said, I'm not standing on any X, Dad. I've watched too many Roadrunner movies. And we laughed. But that's where we're at. John chapter 10. All I want you to see this morning, by the grace of God, we're going to look at the bigger picture for three different people. We're going to look at the bigger picture for Satan, because he's got a bigger picture, boy. We're going to look at the bigger picture from God's vantage point, because he's got a bigger picture. And we're going to look at the bigger picture from man's vantage point. And I don't have this wonderful, great theological thing. This, is, this is, just gripped my heart. I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a simple-minded Christian, okay? Yes, I read. I try to understand. That's why I like hanging around some of you, because all of you are all of you. You're way smarter than I'll ever be. Go to John chapter 10. You think they crucified Jesus Christ? They didn't crucify Jesus Christ. He laid his life down. And he wasn't a martyr either. Because you know what happened to him when he laid it down? He took it up again. Amen. Right on schedule. Go to John chapter 10. All I want you to read is verse number, well, I'll read, I'll read verse 10. I'll read verse 9. Great verse. I am the door. We're in John chapter 10. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief, I'll read 10 now. The thief cometh not. That thief we're going to learn about is the devil. But for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Does that sound like somebody you want to buddy up to? That's your world right there. See, you want, you want preachers now to paint you just this uh, uh, rose-colored glasses, looking at things through rose-colored glasses. The world is a mess. The world is being ruled by madness, and I refuse, according to this book, to enter into that madness. Amen. Amen. I'm not entering in I know many of us is, oh, yes, hey, I, I may have a preference of who's in the White House. But I said it that two Sundays ago. You know what? F almost 51 years ago, I voted for King Jesus. And guess what? Come hell or high water, I win. <laughs> now, you don't need to be like me, but we need to get some steel in our backbone. We need to just say, you know what? My pastor brother said it this morning. 
We need to be in church. I need you. I need you. I'll lay it right out. I'm not a sissy. I'm, I, you know, I, I, I need God's people. Without God's people, I get isolated. My, the devil knows how my hard wiring, he starts to screw around my brain. When I'm away from God's people too long, we said it, didn't we, Brother Pat, didn't we say it the other day? Because you were sick and you needed to stay away from that baby boy. But now, now you, he, he, he got overwhelmed just being able to, man's crazy, work getting his hands dirty with us yesterday. He just loved to be a part of it. So did the rest of us. There's something about being together. We need it. And I'm not belittling the disease, the virus that's going. I know, I, hey, we're not, we're, not, we're not minimizing that at all. But what it's doing, it's isolating us. And some of us are getting spiritually extremely unhealthy. Look at chart, starting with verse number 15, same chapter 10. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. The other sheep I, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I, I, I must bring. All right, we're not going to get into teaching this thing doctrinally. I'm headed, I want you to see a bigger picture here. We're headed to verse number 18. If I can just start with 17 now. Therefore doth my father love me because I laid down my life that I might take it again. That's not a martyr. A martyr just lays his life down, sets himself on fire. I've seen, you've seen pictures, I've seen pictures. Vietnam, I, I watched a video of that. Uh, somebody setting themselves on fire, a Buddhist priest. He didn't take up his life again. Look at verse number 18. You think Jesus Christ was crucified? Yes, he was crucified. But they didn't crucify him. He crucified himself. He laid his own life down. You want to know why I love him? Because boy, there's only one man that could lay that life down and take it up again, man. No man taketh it from me. Here's your bigger picture, folks. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Go with me. I just want to, I, I want to look at just some verses. This is kind of like introduction. Go, go to Proverbs 21 with me. Now again, the simplicity of this thought who is really running the show? <laughs> Who's in charge? My boys would say, he's large and in charge. Who's in charge? My boys, all three of them own their own uh, metal and glass subcontracting, commercial subcontracting company for several years. I was down there with them for those four years to, just to work with him. But when you go on a job site, you know what the superintendent wanted to know? Now, they were all supposedly co-owners and co-equal and all that kind of stuff. But when we got on the job site, you know, you know what that superintendent wanted to know? Who is, he said, I don't want to answer to all three of you. I want to know who's in charge for this period of time for Patriot Metal and Glass, I want to know who I, I'm going to speak to every time I need to know something. So they had to choose a man. It was either Nate, Caleb, or Matt. All right. So who's really in charge with all this that's going on? Because from a human vantage point, this thing's out of control. And if you're not walking with the Lord, guess what? You're going to be scared to death. Saved or lost, you will be scared to death if you can't see that Jesus Christ is still on the throne and everything is being played. He's moving the chess pieces on that board and it's playing out exactly the way he wants. 
Do you realize Jesus Christ was born into, the, at that period of time, the most totalitarian society that the globe really has ever seen? Caesar was God. That's what the Jews even said. We have no God but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. He was worshipped. And God let his only begotten, God took on human form and birthed himself right into a nation that was ruled by cruelty. Immorality everywhere. <laughs> you ever see the, the arenas that they had in those days? We, we've all watched the gladiator movies. Did you ever see certain things just positioned? You talk about immorality. It was immoral. And Jesus Christ was birthed into that, and God let it happen. He not only let it happen, he designed it. Go to Proverbs chapter 21. You see, I have to, I have to get a little gruff with myself. Because when something gets so far out of control, I get angry. That's just my old nature. And I don't, my Bible tells me that's not good. <laughs> I don't want to grow old, older, <laughs> angry and hard and bitter. Oh, why didn't he get four more years in the presidency? Oh, my, what are we going to do? I'm going to continue to love Jesus. That's what I'm going to do. Go to Proverbs 21.1. Here's a verse. We all know it. If you've read your Bible at all or heard, listened to anybody teach or preach, look what it says. You see, you know what this thing is going to do as far as I'm concerned? <sighs> You're either going to believe your Bible or you're not. Bottom line. It's always been that way. But you know when, things, when everything's going good? Oh, it's easy, it's easy to believe the Bible when everything's going good. That's easy money. Yeah, I got you, brother. It's easy money. But when all hell breaks loose... When your life personally just tanks out, bottoms out, when your nation, when your state, when your governor gets mad because the Supreme Court justices 5-4 rule that we can go to church, and he's mad. And the nation's run by idiots. Third graders who have a lie, who even as a third grader have a low IQ. But this is going to separate the men from the boys. The women from the sissies. It is. And I'm going to be honest with you. Bring it on. You're either going to believe this book. We've been at this for 45 years. My pastor took over and I get to help him. I guess I'm helping him. I have no idea. If I'm not, he needs to fire me and I'll sit down and shut up. We're either going to believe this book or we're not. When I'm afraid, you say you get afraid, Brother Pat? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, we're, nobody's walking on water around here. You know, where I, you know where I go to calm my spirit? It's not Fox News. And you got to know it's not CNN. I sit down at my dining room table, that's my desk, and I open up this book one more time. And I say, Father, please, I beg of thee, speak to me. Just speak to me one more time. The heart of the king, 21 1, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. 
As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Let's go. Let's look at some more. Go to, go to Isaiah chapter 44. Now, we're going to let your fingers do the walking, so I'll, I'll get there. Now, if I get there ahead of you, I'm probably going to start uh, because we've got verses. I just want to... And we're not teaching you some big theological thing today. I had to remind myself the other day, boy, there's a bigger picture playing out. And Lord, whatever you want to do. Look at Isaiah chapter 44 and look at verse number 28. You know, this was several hundred years before this was, this was written, several hundred years before it actually happened. He says that saith of Cyrus, you do realize Cyrus was the, the king of Persia. You go back into, or go, oh, where you, yeah, you went back in from Isaiah. You had uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Bab uh, king of Babylon. You had Artaxerxes. You had Darius. You had Cyrus. This is written, this is written pre, before all of that happened. Isaiah would tell of it, but it hadn't happened yet. Look what he says of Cyrus. He is my shepherd. He is my shepherd. And shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built into the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. That's Ezra and Nehemiah. This was, this was foretold many years prior to that. Look at, look at chapter 45. Just move to verse number 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. Cyrus was a Persian. God raised up a brutal dictator named Nebuchadnezzar. Book of Daniel, other books. Puts them into captivity. Seventy years after that, he raises up another Persian named Cyrus and brings him out. You think God's not in control? Look at Jeremiah. Go another book over. Jeremiah chapter 25. Now, we all know it's not wise to just pick verses out of context. But just for the sake of seeing what that particular verse says, that's all I want you to see this morning. God's in control. When I lay down at night, I say, thank you, Father. I pray you give me a good night's rest, me and my wife. I pray you keep my family from the evil. I pray you keep my beloved church family from the evil. And then I don't sit there at the, all night long. I lay down and go to sleep. God made me his son 51 years ago. My father has taken good care of me for 51 years. Blessed beyond all measure, he is mine. Medical problems, disease problems, yeah, I take a heart attack in the pulpit, I go back there and sit down, I'm, th I'm thinking to myself, I know the heart attack, it's, it, I'm taking a heart attack, I got that. I learned, you know, now there's part of me that says, you know, you just should have died in that back row. Well, that day, you know, I looked at my wife and I said, I think I'm taking a heart attack. Call an ambulance. So I, be wise. I'm not telling you to be ignorant of everything and just blow everything off. But I'm not going to walk this earth afraid. You know why? because my God's still on the throne. Amen. And I jokingly said to you, and I've said it to my boys, I said, when God dies, then I've got a problem. But as long as God's alive, I'm okay. Okay. You say, well, Brother Pat, you're one of our pastors. You should be that way. No, you need to be that way. 
I've not always been one of the pastors here. I've dug holes with the best of them. There are some times I'd rather go out and dig a hole than preach the Bible, honest to God. This is actually serious, digging that hole. Any trained monkey can dig a hole. I can, if, you, if I can do it, anybody can do it. You see, this has got nothing to do with seniority. Well, you've been here all these years, and Pastor Mike's been here all these years. Da, 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 da. No, folks, shake it off. You need to get serious. And when I say you, I'm talking about all those people. If you can see me out there in, in, in the World Wide Web. I said to my youngest son, Matthew, we got talking about some serious issues just in life and seasons and all that. And I looked at him and I said, Matt, here, I want, you to, I, want, I want to say one thing to you before you go home. We're running out of time. You and I need to be serious about being better men, about being better Christians, about, about I'm a pastor, yes, co-pastor. You need to, and he started to weep. And he said, Dad, we're running out of time. <laughs> Come on, folks. Shake it off. We're running out of time. Jeremiah, chapter 25, Nebuchadnezzar, verse number 9. Behold, I will send, obviously, it's the prophecy of the 70-year captivity here. Just verse 9 says, Behold, I will, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord. And Nebuch Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar, once again, just a different spelling there, same guy. The king of Babylon, my servant. God handpicked that man. Yeah. Look at uh, chapter 27 and verse number 6. He says it again. Now, do you think the children of Israel just were gloriously thrilled about going into 70 years of captivity? Come on. People died there. That was 70 years. That whole generation, people died. New people were born. Were they thrilled that they could not worship back there in Jerusalem any longer? No, no, no. But you know what God did? And this is, a, this is hard for we Americans, because we Americans think everything revolves around us. And everything does not revolve around us. And once you come to that conclusion and you, it grips your life, it'll change you. I think Pastor Mike said something one time and, 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 and uh, absolute agreement. You know, you know the, the closer you get to God, the less you think of yourself. The closer you get to God, the less you think of yourself. That's why the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians would say, I, I, I'm less than the least of all the saints. But we think everything revolves around America. And I'm going to tell you, it does not. And I'm a patriot at heart. So don't, you, you say, Brother Pat, they're going to give you, I don't even have an email. Don't call me. If you want to cuss me out, write me a letter. I'm old school. Just write me a letter. Write me a blasphemous, evil letter that you hate me. Or come over and have enough guts to knock on my back door. And when I open the door and stand there and look at you, have enough guts to chew me out. I'll take it. I've been chewed on by the best of them. I'll take it. Not a problem. But I've come to realize something. God uses nations. Some nations rise. We're going to read that. Some nations fall. Where did I have you? 27.6. And now have I given all these lands into the hand. Now, 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 now read it, folks. Read it. Read it. Now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, my servant. 
go to, go to Daniel chapter 2. Now here you have, there's typologies, we know that. People, objects can type, be a type of Jesus Christ. People can be a type. Joseph's probably the purest type of Jesus Christ, but Daniel's right behind him. And if you look at Daniel chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading at 19, 219. Now remember, Daniel with his three buddies, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. I know, you, I know we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but that's the name they were given. That wasn't their real name. And the world wants to change your name. I won't charge you for that. The world wants to change your name. Pat, Dean, Christian. See, the world wants to take that last name of who I am, because I'm a Christian. You say, well, you're American. Yeah, I was born and raised in America. Love this nation. But you know, you know before I'm being American, you know what I am? You know there's Christians all over the face of this globe. The world wants to change your name. Go, look at Daniel. Who's in, who is really running the show? You know, I, I'm glad I'm, I, I, God put me on the right side of things. A right way to live. I'm glad Jesus, I, I, yes, you call it getting saved. He captured me. I was running, man. <laughs> I was flat out trying to outrun God. How stupid can I be? Outrun God. You can't outrun God. Just give it up. Turn around and let him capture you. All right. It's the greatest life the last 51 years with Jesus Christ. Greatest life. I, I, I wake up sometimes. I, Lord, I said it to my wife the other day. Why is, why is God so good to us? I don't know. I try to be thankful. Try to keep my heart right. Say, have you buried, you, you, you've never been to a funeral? Oh, yeah, I've been to funerals, been to hospitals, full of, have a body now that's breaking down, wife, breaking, her wife, her life, body's breaking down. I, I, you know, we've been there. My grandson's had cancer, my daughter-in-law had breast cancer, on and on and on. But you want to know something? I got a blessed life. It's just flat blessed. Look at Daniel chapter 2, starting with verse 19. Daniel there's, a, there's a, uh, a dream here that's supposed to be interpreted, and, and it's, not even the, it's, it's more than just the interpretation of the dream. The, the, the king wanted the dream told to him. Like, like how, how, how could I possibly know what you dreamt? All right. But look at verse number. The, he, uh, it's, it's a secret being revealed to Daniel. And in verse number 19 of Daniel chapter 2, just listen to what it says. Now remember, he's in captivity. Now even in captivity, he got elevated. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Now watch 21 and 22, my beloved church family. He changeth the times and the seasons. Wow. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. Go to chapter 4. So he, he sets up kings and removes kings. Do you think Daniel liked being under Nebuchadnezzar? Nope. Let's just be honest. He was human. But somehow God showed Daniel a bigger picture. Go to Daniel chapter 4. And verse number 17. Just again, you got there's a whole bunch of storyline here, but I just want you to see, just keep in mind, he's in captivity. They go into captivity as young men, young men. And they were 70 years in that captivity. And there was, there was good times in that captivity, 
And then there was extreme harshness in that captivity. But look at verse number 17. Again, there's a storyline here, and Daniel's interpreting visions that uh, Nebuchadnezzar is having on his bed. And verse number 17, he says, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent, watch this, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Oh, man, that's not nice. You're going to give the kingdom to a reprobate? Yep, what he did. And then he might give the kingdom to a good guy. And this thing played out, is still playing out even today. Here we go. Let me go back to a thought. I'm either going to believe my Bible. I, two pastors and a dozen deacons who love the Word of God as we do and can teach it. And many others in here who do not hold the, one of those two offices. You love the Word of God. But there is a sobriety that's coming over my mind and my heart. I'm running out of time. This thing is about ready to close. And Jesus Christ is about ready to step out of heaven. And are you ready? That's all I, uh, that's between you and your God, the Jesus Christ. I'm making sure that I'm ready. Now, Pastor and I obviously have a, have a privilege and a responsibility of a congregation. But we've got our own personal families, too. And I'm telling my own children, get ready, get ready, get ready. We're just about ready to leave. Get ready. The devil's bigger picture. He's a deceiver. He's a devourer. He's a destroyer. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. In, in your, in, let me read as you listen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. He's an angel of light. We, we've taught that. We've said that. You've heard that. 1 Peter 5, 8. All of a sudden, he can change himself into a roaring lion. One time, he's Mr. Religious. One time, if he sat on the front row, you'd say, glad to have you, dear friend. Another time, he's as a roaring lion, charging through those back doors, and if he does, that window's mine. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Go to John chapter 11 with me. He's a liar, John chapter 8. Go to John chapter 11. I saw this reading just, and I thought, oh, man, that's a neat, that's just, you know, every once in a while, a verse just stops you. <laughs> now, the older I've gotten in the Lord, the whole Bible stops me. But every once in a while, you're looking for something or, or, or you're not looking for something, and God just says, I want, to, I want you to see something. John chapter 11. Now, this is the raising. This is actually, I preached this at different funerals. And uh, Lazarus has died, Mary and Martha's brother. And if you look at 1115, we'll just plug that in for the sake of doing it. 1115 he waited four days. You find that out down in verse number th uh, 39. Waited four days. This has been taught here on a Wednesday night. The word life appears on the fifth day of creation. By this time in verse 39, he stinketh because he'd been dead four days. But look at verse number 15. Bigger picture. 
You know what the devil's bigger picture is? We're going to read this. He's, his big picture is deceiving you, devouring you, destroying you, lying to you. And the only way you're going to understand any of that is if you actually immerse yourself in this old King James Bible so that you can smell a lie. The ear, try, Job said this, the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth meat. If you give me a piece of meat, I can tell you whether, I don't like turkey. I don't eat turkey at Thanksgiving. I eat roast beef. You say, why? I don't like the taste of turkey. I don't know. I've eaten venison. I've eaten horse. I ate horse when I was in college. Had a buddy in a deboning factory. He gave me a slab of Back quarter of a, a horse wasn't diseased. Just horses die. And he said, just cube it up and put it in a stew. And my wife made a delicious stew. And if you didn't know it was horse, you'd, you, you'd never know it was horse. You're gonna, you, you think I'm going to say it tastes like chicken, but it didn't taste like chicken. You get a taste for certain things. You know what's happened in my own life personally? And I know I, you know, this sounds a little personal. After 51 years of reading this book, I got a taste for this book. It's a taste, man. So when somebody gives me something, Bobby Bowman, he loves to give us a lot of things to listen to. I listened to it. I told him, listen, I got to re-listen to that about six times before, I know, before I'm going to either agree with it or throw it out the window. Okay. This book will give you, you will know a deceiver when it comes along. And boy, there are multiple voices out there. It's already been said way better than I could ever say it. Your greatest enemy right now is the internet. I know I'm old school. Shut the TV off. Shut your computer off. Oh, God, I can't do that. Shut your phone off. Oh, Pastor, you're just not a realist. You want to grow? You get yourself into that book. You sit down in the quietness of about an hour. You can, you can invest an hour. Come on, you can. You don't think you can, but you can. And you know what God will do? The still small voice of God will speak to you. 15, and I am glad for your sakes. Wait a minute. He just said he was glad that Zacchaeus died. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent, here's that word again, that ye may believe. Whoo! He let a man die so I could believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Now, jump over to verse number 45, same chapter. Then many of the Jews, the friends of Mary and Martha are being saved here, and says, then, uh, then many of the Jews which came to Mary, 1145, then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. Now remember, the devil can use people. He's a spiritual being. We're told he entered into Judas Iscariot. The devil can use anybody he wants to use. Now he can't indwell a believer. You're sealed under the day of redemption. He can't get into you. But he can affect you. But remember, he's a liar. He has no good intentions toward you. His bigger picture, and we're going to read it, his bigger picture is, I want you to disbelieve everything that God has written. Yea, hasn't changed a bit from the garden. Yea, hath God said. That was his agenda. That's been the devil's bigger picture. Oh, yes, there's been wars and rumors of wars. But you know what his bigger picture is? We're going to read it. Look at 46. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. 
47. Then gather the chief priests and the Pharisees a council. By the word, let me just word, let me just throw this in. The word council, when it appears in your Bible, C-I-L, is never good. God doesn't work through councils. There's religions that are very close to us, proximity-wise, that it's this council and that council and that council over hundreds of years, this council and that council. My Bible tells me God never used the council. Oh, he counsels, S-E-L. But he's never used the council, C-I-L. And sometimes people refer to the book of Acts when they talk about the gathering of the believers at Jerusalem, but that text never uses the word council. It isn't the council of the, of the believers at Jerusalem. I have a heading in my Bible that says that. But in the reading of the text, the word council is never there. All right, moving on. What do we, verse 47, for this man doeth many miracles. Now watch verse number 48. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. What a statement. If the devil would just give up and admit he's beaten, you know what would happen? People would get saved all over the face of this globe. That's what that says. If we let him thus alone, and, 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 the, and the bigger picture that Satan has, he's never going to leave Jesus Christ alone, never going to leave the truth alone. He's never going to leave you alone. He's got his ministers of unrighteousness who are being transformed into ministers of righteousness. And the Romans shall come. Now, why, why? now he's using these Pharisees here. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and, our, and, and nation. Go to, go to Revelation chapter 20. Now, he has been locked up for a thousand years. Go to Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, in verse number 7, he's loosed. Now, he's been chained up for a thousand years. And God lets him loose. Jesus Christ lets him loose. But look what he does. Now, you would think after being locked up for a thousand years, you'd have, you'd, it would change your life just a little bit. Okay? Soften your heart just a little bit. But that's not what happened. 20 and verse number 7. And when the thousand years were expired, are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Verse 8. And shall go out. Well, here we go again, man. Starting all over. That's his bigger picture. Shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog, Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as, as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed uh, uh, the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. After being reigned in for a thousand years, you know what he does? His bigger picture. He went out and deceived a host of nations. Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, the just judge, the, the right king, has sat on that throne of David for a thousand years, ruled in righteousness. I can't wait. I just want to see this world run correctly by my, by my God. Satan is loosed and after a thousand years, and you know what he does? He gets up and he goes out and deceives a bunch of nations, and they all get destroyed. Let's look at God. So you know what we can see about the devil's bigger picture? The devil's bigger picture is himself. I will be like the Most High. I will. We know that. You know what this generation is? The me generation. Let's take a selfie. You got to watch this me thing. The devil's bigger picture was himself. 
Do you know who God's bigger picture is? There are three words that epitomize God's bigger picture. For your sake. You know who God's bigger picture is? You say, well, the theme of the Bible is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. No, let, let's take it back farther than that. You know what God's bigger picture is? You. You. And me. Go to Genesis chapter 18. Go to Genesis chapter 18. Look at verses 26, 29, 31, and 32. Genesis chapter 18. All right, a portion of this chapter has to do with uh, uh, Abraham and where we're going to be, Abraham becoming the uh, intercessor uh, for Sodom and Gomorrah here, all right? But uh, again, watch what he says. Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 20 starts his, his intercession uh, the question that he asked in 23, Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Look at verse number 26. Now, again, I want you to see those three words. Sometimes it's four, yet. We'll see a, a verse in the New Testament. For your sake. For your sake. You know what God does? We're go All through your Bible, for Israel's sake, he does it for his word's sake. He does it for your sake. God's always working on the behalf, for the behalf of somebody else. God's not selfish. He's not narcissistic. Remember the, the young lad in Greek mythology, Narcissus, who fell in love with himself, looked into a body of water, and couldn't get over it. How handsome you are. There's where we get our word. Narcissism. Somebody who just flat loves themselves. Let me go back to my comment. The closer you get to Jesus Christ, the less you will think of yourself. You say, well, you got to have some self-esteem. Try to find that one in the Bible. If I have any self-esteem, it's only because of the personage of Jesus Christ. He made me worth. He loved me in spite of myself. <laughs> Genesis 18. Look at verse 26. I'll read 26, 29, 31, 32. 26. And the Lord said... If I find in Sodom 50, because there's it's kind of like a negotiation going on here, lack of better terms, I see it that way. He said in 26, and the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, now it's a big city, just 50, then I will spare all the place for their sake. For the sake of those 50, I'll spare everybody. Look at verse 29. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure, there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it. I'll not destroy it for forty's sake. Look at verse 31. I know this is an ultra-simplistic message, but you know what I have to do in my life? I have to bring things down to their lowest common denominator. That keeps me from fear. That keeps me from anger. That keeps me from wanting to hurt somebody. <laughs> I know you guys walk on water. I don't walk on water. Look at 31. 
And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there be twenty found there. And he said, God says, I will not destroy it for twenty sake. If I could find twenty. For those twenty sake, I'll spare this city. Do you ever stop to think maybe God is holding the destruction of certain cities because there's some believers? There's a body of believers in that city, in that borough, in that part of the world. And God says, listen, I'm not going to, I'm not going to destroy it because there's a body of my believers down there. There's my family. And for their sake, for their sake, for their sake. Bigger picture. Ultra simplistic. I've got that. The devil's bigger picture was himself. Look at verse 30. Well, I'll read 32. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak yet but one, this once peradventure. Ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten sake. 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 Let's just speed along. Go now to 2 Corinthians. We know this verse. If you're a new Christian, it may be new to you, but some of us who have got a f- just a few more years on of reading and trying to love, go to 2 Corinthians 8. Your New Testament giving, your New Testament giving is not found in the tithe of the Old Testament. That If you want to do that, that's your business. But 2 Corinthians chapter 8 really is New Testament giving. It's a great chapter. Let me show you the bigger picture of giving. God's bigger picture, Satan's bigger picture is himself. God's bigger picture is you. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Just reading the verse. If you don't have this underlined in your Bible, I, I challenge you to underline it. Highlight it. This is one of the most sacred verses in all of your Bible. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich. (laughs) I'm sorry, I get happy when I read my Bible. Do you know what God's bigger picture is? You. You. That verse tells me it's you. For your sake, he became poor. Yeah. Somebody say, do you love the body of Christ in First Bible Church. Oh, absolutely. I love this property, crazy as that sounds. I love this building. I was in it when none of this was here. Doesn't make me better. I've just been here longer, that's all. The print shop that we've expanded, that was just an empty building. Then Joe Silvestri had his first Youth class up there it didn't even have heat, didn't have a bathroom. There was a pot belly stove. Everything that you folks see now was not here. But now this is going to lead me to my next point. Because if Christianity is all you love, and if First Bible Church is all you love, you've, mi- you've missed the bigger picture. The devil's bigger picture is himself. God's bigger picture is you. For your sakes he became poor. Me. The worst thing for my family to ask me at Thanksgiving is to pray over the food. I can't do... My mind goes back 
to being forgiven. My mind goes back when I was lost, without God, without Christ. And all of a sudden, God captured me. I didn't get saved by Christianity. I didn't get saved by being a good Baptist or whatever. That morning, God stepped out of heaven. He showed me for me. In a main auditorium that had 3,000 people in it, I was all by myself. You know what man's bigger picture is? God. If your bigger picture is, well, that's my ministry, and, and I love that one, boy, and oh, I'm a good piano player, or I'm a good singer, or maybe I'm a good preacher, and I, and I, and I, and I, I that's not the bigger picture. You know what's going to keep this place alive, for God's sake? Is when you fall in love with God. When Jesus Christ becomes your bigger picture. Your testimony. Can I just take you to, go to, go to Psalm chapter 5. We're wrapping this up. Can I take you to Psalm chapter 5? Because now God's going to change this. Remember, God's bigger picture was for your sake. Go to Psalm chapter 5 with me. You forgive me when sometimes I say things that are, sound a little self-serving. But, uh, and and we've, we've taught this here. All of us have taught this and heard it. The Bible, Isaiah would write, come now, let us reason together. You know, your reasoning is done in that part of your brain, all right? And your heart, we know, is not in here. But God takes it from your mind, and he begins to put it into the, the heart part of your brain, okay? But then somewhere, if you get sober, off the drunk of the world, he puts it in your bones. We said that last week about Jeremiah. He was weary with forbearing and he could not stay. It had gotten into his bones. The very place where your blood is made. I love, I love you. <laughs> I love this place. I know it sounds crazy, but I, I, I love this old warehouse. I've seen miracles, 45 years of miracle after miracle after miracle. Joys and heartaches. But that's not my bigger picture. My Bible tells me my bigger picture needs to be God. Look at chapter 5. Look at verse number 7. You see, God's bigger picture was yet for your sake. But now man's bigger picture becomes God. You became God's, I became God's bigger picture. Long before the Ark of the Covenant, long before the kingdoms, he came down in the cool of the evening to fellowship with a man that he named Adam. Just for fellowship. That, 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 uh, that overwhelms me that God, the creator of everything you see, would want a fellowship with me? <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> but that's what he wants. God wants to be Christ. Paul wrote it. Christ is all. That's the bigger picture. And I can tell you for sure after walking these many years, if you keep that in front of your brain, in the forefront of your life, it keeps things sweet. I said to my boys again, you know, they're married along. They got, their kids are growing up, pretty soon going to be out of the house. Now they ask mom and dad these questions. How'd you guys make it 51 years? <laughs> it certainly wasn't me. 
But you know, somewhere in this journey, God impressed me with something. And he said, you must love me first that you might love her best. You must love me first so that you could love your beloved church the best. Look at chapter 5, verse 7. Notice how it changed from for your sakes, but now it says, but as for me. <laughs> Notice it doesn't say, but as for us. Maybe there are places it does. But everyone I looked at said, but as for me. Do you know how personal that is? We've often said this. You know where revival starts? It doesn't start in your heart. It starts in my heart. By the grace of God, maybe it bleeds over into somebody else. But you know where it starts? Me. Look at verse, chapter 5, verse 7. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Look at chapter 17. We'll just stay in... Psalm 17, 15. David writes again. Again, we're just kind of handpicking a verse that kind of jumped off the page to me. As for me. You see, when your God gets personal with you, to you, he's not part of your life. I don't have life. <laughs> Beloved family, we do not have life without Jesus Christ. Everything we do here must always, the bigger picture must always be Jesus Christ, God. 17.15 says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied. When I awake with thy likeness. Look at chapter 26. Look at verse number 11. The word integrity is used here, and it says this, it's a firm adherence to moral values. And David writes again in 26.11, it says, but as for me. You see, there's the difference between religion and relationship. I fell in love. I'll, I'll say it as Mel Sabaka, our founding pastor, <laughs> said it, and some, some guys started to laugh. I fell in love with a man. <laughs> a man loved me, wooed me. I fell in love with him. I can't even explain it. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity, redeem me, and be merciful unto me. Look at chapter 35, verse number 13. You want to know how to treat those who malign you? You'll forgive me as I said, the worst thing to ask Pat Dean to do is to say the prayer over the food at Thanksgiving because something's going to get cold. <laughs> Because God just, you talk about being thankful. The first thing to go when somebody gets cold, when your heart grows hard, is you stop being thankful. You just stop being thankful. Where do I have you? 3513. Now, 
it, the chapter starts out, plead my cause. There's, there's, there's problems going on here. But look what David says in 13. But as for me, <laughs> when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. And my prayer returned into mine own bosom. I prayed for him and the prayer bounced back to me. As for me. You see, the devil, his bigger picture was himself. God's bigger picture was you, is you. Man's bigger picture should be God. Go to chapter 41, just a couple more and we'll say amen. Look at chapter 41, same book, Psalm, chapter 41, 12. Again, David's writing, and uh, somebody in verse number 9, and that somebody was Judas Iscariot, he says, prophetically, he said, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Prophetic pronouncement of, announcement of Judas Iscariot. He says in verse number 12, and as for me, David, you know, David, uh, we all know David's history. David was a rascal. <laughs> he was a warrior. But, uh, boy, he could be a rascal at times. And, uh, and we know the story of Bathsheba and Uriah, one of my favorite in the Bible, other than Jesus and a couple others. But Uriah, just, he just loved his king. He was, he was a Hittite. He wasn't even a Jew, really. And uh, David had him murdered to cover up the sin with Bathsheba. Did he pay a price, David? Oh, yes. Terrible price. But again, the promise was made to David, yet for his sake. And Jesus Christ is not going to sit on the throne of Solomon. He's going to sit on the throne of David. And in verse number 12, he says, And as for me, thou upholdest me in mine integrity. Set us before me thy face forever. As for me, let me give you, let me give you just a couple more. We're, we're okay. Go, go to chapter 41. Oh, no, I just did 41. Go to chapter 55. See, man's bigger picture needs to be God. I love this place. I, I, I just, I just, <laughs> I have these conversations with my pastor brother and Bobby and others. It's just, maybe it's because I've been here this long. I've seen the prayer and the sweat and the, and the monies that were just graciously poured in, you know. Watch that building go up out there, and, and, uh, and, and it, 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 it looks like it was always there. And I stand on my deck sometimes, but this place didn't save me. Oh, it helped me grow. <laughs> but my bigger picture has to be God. Not America. Oh, I love my nation. I'll fly that flag until I die. My, Nathan, my son Nathan has my father. He was a veteran. I preached his funeral. Nate asked me for the flag. I gave it to Nate. I've got my father-in-law's flag sitting in my living room. He was a Navy veteran. This country means a great deal to me. If they would ask me to go to war even at 70 years old, I'd say, give me, give me whatever weapon you got. Let's go. Let me tell you what, I would be a better soldier at 70 than I could have been at 19. I can guarantee you that. God had other things in mind, though. But the bigger picture has to be God. 55, 16. All right, did I read that yet? Maybe I read it all. No, no. Did I read it? No. 55, 55, 16. Again, David's writing here. I, 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 want to, I'll, I keep repeating myself. It's not the wisest thing just to pull a verse out, but I want you to see this. 55, 16, as for me. <laughs> you think David had a relationship with God? Whew. Man, he did. He was a rascal at times. Paid dearly for it. But there was something about his love of God. God let him write Psalm 119, the greatest chapter on the word of God. He had a love 
He, he, he loved God's word. Oh, he got into sin and God, God corrected him, but he didn't condemn him. And God will sit on his throne. Jesus Christ. As for me, 16, 55, 16, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. I hope you, I hope you have not gotten over the day that Jesus Christ saved you. It's just one of those things I, I can't even explain why, but of all the things in life, that day has stayed fresh in my mind. I never tire when somebody just preaches the gospel. Tell me it again. I want to hear it one more time. One more verse. 69.13. Same book, Psalm. 69.13. The bigger picture. Satan's bigger picture is always himself. Even to the time of him being destroyed, chained for a thousand years, he rises up at the permission of God and deceives nations. And it's his final demise. God's bigger picture is you. Yet for your sake. Yet for your sake. My sake, our sake. Yet for your sake he became poor. Look at 55, six, or, uh, what did I say? 69, 13, excuse me. 69, 13. David again, writing. Here's that phrase again. But as for me, but as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me, in the truth of thy salvation. But as for me, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. If you know not the Savior, we would be delighted to sit down and simply show you from the Bible if, if you're confused. But boy, it's not a hard thing. There was a, a publican who went into a temple and he wasn't, he was not a righteous man. He didn't even know the law very well. He didn't know it at all, probably. But God got a hold of his heart that day and he bowed his head and smote upon his breast, the Bible says, and he prayed seven words. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I've often thought, what, what words would you take out of that? And in truth, you can't take any out. God is who the prayer was directed to. Be merciful. That's what he was looking for. To me, the direction was himself. A sinner. He realized his condition. He could not get to God. God had to come to him. And Jesus Christ said that man went down to his house justified rather than the other who was a Pharisee and he was self-righteous. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The other man refused to humble himself. And Christian, let me say this to you. Let's keep our eyes on the bigger picture. God's bigger picture is us. Our bigger picture needs to be God. Let's go. Let's, let's wing our way to the third heaven with an orchestra of First Bible Church shouting. Ready to go. Having lived, having lived in our own integrity, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your goodness. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for uh, loving us.
you became poor, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. May we realize our riches today have nothing to do with a bank account. We are sons and daughters of the living God. I say thank you. And Father, our folks who are ill, I'm asking that you would be merciful. Your Bible tells me we are not, it is of your mercies that we are not consumed. Your compassions that are new every morning and never fail. And I ask that in behalf of our own people in this place. Thank you for your kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Lord bless you. We are dismissed.